Welcome back to the JMZ Online YouTube channel. Today we're taking a step back in history as we rebuild a set of W Series big block Chevrolet heads, which we believe are out of a mid 60s 80 Series Chevy truck. The 348 and 409 W Series engines are a unique design in that the combustion chamber is actually built into the upper part of the cylinders in the block, and the valves are completely perpendicular to the head gasket surface with only a small relief in the head as opposed to a chamber like we would normally see on gas engines. Our customer brought us this set of heads which we were told are off of a 409 truck engine and we had six broken exhaust manifold studs that I expected to be a pain but actually ended up coming out without even breaking out the welder which was a pretty pleasant surprise. Down the road it would be awesome to get our hands on one of these engines to do a complete build for the channel but in this case we're just going to be going through the heads today. The heads have already been baked, steel shot blasted, and inspected for cracks and defects before my dad got them set up on the TCM25 seat and guide machine to start drilling out the guides for replacements. With the head leveled on the machine, the air float table is used to move from one guide to the next, and a piloted core drill and reamer is used to drill the head casting out to a nominal half inch diameter. With the head drilled, the bores are lubricated with press fit lubricant and our universal replacement cast iron valve guides are driven into place using the air hammer. The interference fit here is around two thousandths of an inch. The replacement guides are also a bit long, so with the top side of the head leveled up, we can trim down the top of the guide while simultaneously machining for positive Viton valve stem seals, which help modernize the lubrication of the valve stems on these nearly 60-year-old heads. As always, we use a diamond valve guide hone to hone the ID of the valve guide in order to hit the desired specification on our valve stem clearance. In our experience, honing produces a superior end result over simply reaming the guides, even though it takes significantly more time. But it is worth it, as the valve guide serves as the foundation for the rest of the valve job. While the intake seats don't show significant wear, the exhaust seats do. And therefore, we will measure the diameter of the valve, as well as take some measurements on the cylinder head itself, before referring to the valve seat catalog and finding a replacement seat that has optimal dimensions for this head. We keep a ton of seats on the shelf so that we can prevent a ton of dead time in the middle of a job, and in this case we're going to be going with a seat that is 1 and 3 quarter inch OD and 1 and 3 eighths inch ID, which will give me a bit of extra material to trim out on the inside of the seat. With the cutter set up in the Surti, I went ahead and used the DRO on the machine to touch down on both ends of the head and make sure we were level within a few thousandths of an inch. The seat we decided to go with is a quarter inch deep, but I am only going to put it in at 7 seconds inch depth and trim off the top to avoid any risk of hitting water and scrapping these heads which would be very difficult to replace. Since my head is perfectly level and we're going to be trimming the top of the seat anyway, I was able to set the spindle lock on the machine one time and quickly run through and cut the counterboards for all four exhaust seats in this first head. It depends on the diameter of the seat, but I typically run in the range of 2 to 300 RPM on the spindle here and keep steady pressure on the tool with a bit of coolant sprayed on the cutter intermittently which helps cut nice and keeps down on some of the cast iron dust. One question that people typically ask is what kind of interference fit the valve seats have. That question often depends on the diameter of the seat in question as well as the parent material of the head itself. The cutters are designed to cut the nominal seat diameter, so in this case the cutter makes a 1 and 3 quarter inch diameter counterbore in this head. The seat we're using is listed as a 1 and 3 quarter inch diameter seat, but in reality the press is built into the seat and the actual diameter of the seat insert is 1.755 inches giving us a press fit of 5 thousandths of an inch. Cutting the intake seats, we're gonna see the bottom angle come in, followed by the 40 thousandths inch wide 45 degree seat angle, and then the top angle. Since we aren't installing seat inserts on the intake, we simply wanna closely match and clean up the intake seating surface. As discussed earlier in the video, the exhaust seat insert we had on the shelf is a bit tall for the head and also a bit small in the inside diameter. As such, our first operation is to go through all of the exhaust seats and open up the inside of the seat until it just blends into the exhaust port. In a perfect scenario, you can find a seat that closely matches the port already, but if that isn't the case, it's just a quick tool change and clean it up like it is here. With the ID blended, I set up a three angle cutter to cut the exhaust seat. Once again, the bottom angle comes in, followed by an 80 thousandths wide 45 degree seat angle, and then a bit of top angle. When you're cutting a new seat insert, it's a bit more difficult to get everything set to the right diameter, so before cutting to our final depth, I went ahead and put some color on one of our freshly reground exhaust valves and use a lapping stick to rub the color off of the valve face where it's seating against the freshly cut valve seat. I like the diameter, so I also took a measurement of our valve spring installed height, which when compared with the stock install height specification gives me an indication of how much deeper I need to cut the seat. At this point, using the digital spindle readout on the machine, we can cut the additional depth needed on the seat to hit the required spring install height specification. 
if I remember correctly, running around 250 RPM with just the right amount of pressure on the wheel to keep the tool cutting left us with a beautiful chatter-free valve seat cut to the perfect depth. At this point in the process, we always use the vacuum gauge on the machine, which we have found is the best way to represent whether or not a valve will seal when in service. If something's wrong at this point, you will see that needle on the gauge drop back to zero very quickly, but in this case, a small amount of leak down is normal as there's always clearance between the valve stem and the valve guide, which allows small amounts of vacuum to escape. With all the seat work complete, we're moving on to resurfacing the heads, and the exhaust gasket surfaces of the heads had some pretty significant pitting from corrosion, possibly due to being exposed to the elements for just a few too many years. Luckily, that's what our RMC 1000 surfacing mill is for. After the first couple of cuts, the damage was made even more visible, and at this point, we could use a dial indicator to get a quick idea of how much more needed to be cut in order to leave us with a nice flat ceiling surface. When it was all said and done, we took 21 thousandths off of the head, which is significant, but there have definitely been worse heads come through the shop. After we cut the exhaust surfaces, we fixtured the heads on the machine to allow us to resurface the head gasket ceiling surface of the head. With a head of this size and weight, we do require an additional support standoff to keep the head rigid and level to the cutting head and the cutting head uses a single CBN cutting insert spinning at just over 600 RPM. If you've hung around this long, we want to remind you to like and subscribe, as well as leaving a comment for my father and I to read. We love seeing what everyone has to say. Additionally, please check out the links in the description if you want to help support the channel and our small business. With the heads fully resurfaced, they go into our smaller spray cabinet for the final wash before assembly, along with all of the hardware. Everything is being reused here, with the valves having been reground off camera. Our smaller spray cabinet here runs a strong detergent, which is recirculated through a closed system. All of the parts are then rinsed with fresh water and blown dry in a timely manner in an effort to prevent significant flash rusting of the clean parts. Given the age and rarity of this engine, new stock replacement parts are difficult to source and expensive if you can even find them. In this case, all of the hardware checked out is being reusable. The valves were reground here in the shop, and the valve springs were all checked and tested to be sure that they were in fair condition. As always during assembly, the valve stems receive a bit of assembly lubricant to ensure sufficient lubrication on initial startup. Our positive valve stem seals are installed using a bit of lacquer thinner to lubricate the seal as it's pushed on, which then evaporates off, leaving the seal tight on the head. On the exhaust side, the rotators are installed underneath the valve springs, and these heads are also using the original seals, which actually simply equates to an O-ring installed in the second groove of the valve stem, and the thin metal shield that goes between the valve spring and the retainer. This method effectively acts as an umbrella, keeping excessive oil from running down the valve stem into the chamber. In combination with positive seals, the lubrication of the valves will be metered nicely. Being out of a truck, these heads may not be as special as what came off of some of the old school 409 engines in cars, but even so, it's fun to put this old iron under the knife and get it back to as good as new and keep this history alive. Thank you for taking the time to watch another video from us here at Jamzy, and we'll see you in the next one.